Uh, yeah, so I think uh, often it's easy to look at the world and think, why on earth is nothing changing? Um, I don't know if people saw uh, earlier this year when uh, Oxfam released this report which said that uh, eight people, eight men, own exactly the same, or own the same amount of wealth as half the world, as uh, 3.6 billion people. So sometimes you might think, well, look, why don't these 3.6 billion people just band together, overthrow these eight, and share around uh, their wealth between everyone, and, you know, everything would be sorted. Now, obviously, these eight people and uh, the capitalist class as a whole have various ways and means of uh, stopping uh, this from happening, of maintaining the status quo. <clears throat> they have, for example, forces of repression. They have uh, the state of armed bodies of men in defence of private property uh, in order to maintain uh, the system as it is. But as Ben said, there are, um, there are other ways uh, that the ruling class maintains its power. And in fact, the... Um, you know, if the ruling class was to solely use force, it could never maintain uh, its rule. It could never maintain its rule because it is such a small uh, minority of society. And so it needs uh, other things. It needs ideas. Um, and one of the main uh, ways it maintains its power is uh, through morality. <clears throat> um, now, one of the uh, fundamental texts on this question, I think... Uh, kind of deals with the Marxist approach to morality best is uh, a little pamphlet by uh, Leon Trotsky called Their Morals and Ours. Um, and in this, uh, he basically says, um, he you know, defines the, or he explains the role, the function of morality in uh, class society. <clears throat> and he says, the ruling class forces its ends upon society and habituates it into considering all those means which contradict its ends as immoral. That is the chief function of official morality. It pursues the idea of the greatest possible happiness, not for the majority, but for a small and ever-diminishing minority. Such a regime could not have endured for, for even a week through force alone. It needs the cement of official morality. <clears throat> but that's also good so far. And, um, you know, as uh, Ben alluded to in, in, in the introduction, this uh, cement is not indestructible. If we look at uh, society, if we look at capitalism today, capitalism is in a deep, deep crisis. Uh, capitalism is capable of overcoming these crises, but only by preparing the way further down the line for an even deeper crisis. If we look at the last big crisis, which happened in uh, 2008... That was solved, in a certain sense, by uh, states across the world um, bailing out the banks, which meant, in effect, that uh, all of this private debt that had been accumulated was turned into state debt. And the problem with debt, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, is that eventually it needs to be paid back. Uh, and who paid it back? Well, it was the working class who paid it back. Uh, if you look at just uh, figures for Britain... Uh, in, in the last 10 years, the average wage of uh, working class people in Britain has reduced by £800. Uh, and that's just the average figure. If you look at people in their 20s, uh, the average wage of people in their 20s has reduced by £1,000 a year, and people in their 30s by more than £2,000 <coughs> per year. So there it is. That's black and white. That's who's paid for the crisis. There's Trotsky as well, who said that in a period of crisis... When the ruling class tries to restore equilibrium in one plane, so in this case, uh, the ruling class, through austerity, has tried to restore equilibrium in the economic plane, they only do that at the cost of causing instability in uh, other planes. And that's what uh, Ben has alluded to. But also, we can see it if we just look at the world uh, today. If we look at uh, the political sphere, for example... You name a country, pretty much, and uh, the major parties in that country are suffering. You see, uh, in Germany, in Sweden, in France, in Italy, you know, you can literally name pretty much any country, and the major historical parties there are suffering. Now, obviously, Britain is one uh, exception, in that uh, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are still um, in doing, quite well, doing very well in the polls, but that, uh, that is for very specific reasons, in that both parties really have been taken over by uh, what the media like to call populists. <clears throat> anyway, that's uh, another story. 
uh, again, you can see uh, you know, major institutions like the European Union are, uh, are crumbling, basically. I mean, sometimes you wonder what's going to happen first. Will Britain leave the European Union or will the European Union crumble to bits? Um, you can see uh, the national question is rearing its head in country after country. People are questioning uh, age-old bonds or you know, very old uh, relations. You've got a crisis of ideas. Uh, ben himself will be talking on the crisis of liberalism uh, tomorrow. You've got also a crisis of religion. Um, who would have thought, for example, that uh, in Ireland there would be a vote uh, to legalise abortion? I also saw on the news as well that uh, um, over 50% of people in Britain now consider themselves to be non-religious. So there's a crisis in all, uh, in all planes, really, and one of those uh, planes is the crisis of morality. <clears throat> you, can just, uh, you can just turn on the news these days and you can uh, open a newspaper and you can see someone uh, talking about the crisis of morality. There's also uh, there's a podcast series on at the moment that I saw. Um, it's by uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who uh, some of you might know. He's been in the news recently for criticising Corbyn, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, for supposed anti-Semitism. That's another story entirely. He, uh, but in this podcast, he, so he wonders whether within our culture is there a place for morality anymore. Uh, he defines morality as being uh, what lifts us above the pursuit of self-interest and self-esteem. It's the things we do, not just because they're good for me, but because they're good for us at a national level. It's about the values, virtues and ideals that bind us together as a society. I think that's uh, quite a good <laughs> um, kind of illustration of the function that, cla- uh, that morality plays in class society from someone who's <laughs> definitely not a Marxist. It binds people together. It uh, binds contradictory classes together in order to justify the oppression and exploitation of the vast majority of people uh, by the minority. <clears throat> but even so, this definition from uh, Sachs is incomplete. So he talks about you know, good and bad as if they're unchanging uh, concepts that are fixed in all of time. Actually, when, you know, when we actually think about it, what actually is good and what's bad? I mean, I'm sure most people in this room would probably think uh, that cannibalism is bad, for example. Um, I mean, I hope so, <laughs> otherwise they'll think I'll be making a, a quick exit. Um, but, you know, that's not, that's not always been the case. Um, there's strong evidence uh, to show that our ancestors practiced cannibalism uh, relatively regularly. Uh, you can almost imagine a, uh, a banquet of cannibals in, uh, in, in this time, where uh, you know, the, the kind of plates being passed around and you get past a big bowl and you're, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't eat human. And, uh, you know, there'd be complete amusement. People would be like... What, what are you talking about? I mean, it's natural to eat human. It's, uh, it's human nature to eat human. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, actually, I think it would be a similar response to what uh, a lot of Marxists get when we uh, question the uh, existence of private property in, uh, in uh, society today, actually. But it's not just uh, cannibalism. I mean, you know, I think most people here would think uh, slavery is bad, for example. Um, but if you were to go to kind of ancient Rome or uh, or Greece, um, you would uh, it would that idea would be completely nonsensical. Um, maybe not to the slaves, perhaps, but to uh, you know good citizens, they would uh, think that it can be completely mad if you questioned uh, the existence of slavery, um, question whether it was right or not. <clears throat> um, one person to actually question. Uh, whether it was right to own slaves was uh, Aristotle, um, and he, you know, he. I mean, I think it shows uh, what a great thinker he was. Actually, that he was capable of even asking this question, because when you think about it, thank you. His whole existence, the whole uh, reason for him being able to uh, sit around and think all day, depended on the existence of a class of people to do all of the work uh, for him. So the very foundations of society back then depended on the existence of slave labour. Um, and that uh, basically influenced uh, the morality of the time and meant that it was basically impossible for Aristotle to conclude uh, anything else. 
<coughs> We're also taught from birth uh, that stealing is wrong. Um, it's wrong to steal. But, I mean, if you imagine in a society where uh, there's no such thing as private property, this, uh, this kind of moral precept would be considered ridiculous as well. Uh, <clears throat> and we don't just have to imagine that. It's not like, uh, you know, some uh, nice utopian communist society where there's no private property. You can just look at uh, pre-class societies. Um, and there are, you know, as we all know, so there are different, uh, different societies developed at different rates. And there were, were examples uh, of people from societies where there was uh, this conception of private property who encountered people uh, where this wasn't the case. Um, and so one example I kind of, uh, was told about was uh, so Captain Cook, who was this uh, explorer at the time of the British Empire, who, when he was uh, exploring uh, the Pacific Islands, he came across some individuals in uh, Hawaii. And these people had no concept <coughs> of private property. Um, and they actually took one of his boats. And so, being the good uh, British moral man, he went to uh, punish these people. Uh, and he tried to uh, arrest their king. In the end, uh, he ended up being killed by them. Uh, but what I think this shows is that there is no such thing as a uh, supra-historical morality that exists outside of time and outside of space. Morality changes with the changing society. Uh, and it's influenced to a huge degree by the economic structure um, of society. <clears throat> but, you know, people might, uh, people might say, okay, fine, look, yeah, morality changes to a certain degree. But aren't there some moral precepts? Aren't there some things that, you know, are just always wrong? Uh, you know, is it always wrong to kill, for example? Um, and, yeah, look, obviously, <laughs> you know, we don't just kind of walk around killing people all of the time. Uh, that's very true. There are certain moral precepts that we hold merely from being uh, members of a common society. Actually, if you delve a little bit deeper, these moral precepts have less of a hold um, in, uh, in certain situations. So, um, you know, these precepts are actually quite limited um, and can be quite unstable. Uh, so, you know, if you take this example of killing, uh, just as one, one example... Obviously, most people wouldn't ever dream of killing someone else. But if you uh, came across an individual who was absolutely determined to murder you or your family or a friend of yours, you know, it's quite unlikely that you'd be kind of racked with self-doubt. You'd kind of sit around, have a huge moral kind of, like, should I act, shouldn't I? I don't think so. I think you'd act to the best of your ability to defend yourself, your friends, um, or your family. Um, and the, the law recognises this with, uh, you know, lesser punishments uh, for people who murder and self-defence. Also, if you look at, uh, so the state is, uh, is what uh, punishes people for committing uh, murder. Well, you know, the state itself will turn this precept 180 degrees if, uh, if there's a war is declared. So thou shalt not kill becomes... Uh, Thou shalt kill as many of the enemy as you uh, possibly can. <clears throat> but these moral precepts that um, kind of are in existence in uh, society are also limited by the fact that the society we live in is a class society. And so actually, the moral obligations that we kind of feel uh, to others, I would say we feel all the more strongly, uh, the less universal they are. Uh, so Trotsky gives the example of um, the uh, solidarity that striking workers feel towards their fellow stri striking workers. The moral obligations that these uh, workers feel towards each other would be far more strong than uh, the generalised kind of human, human uh, solidarity that people feel uh, to other humans purely on the basis of being uh, human. Um, another kind of reason why, or kind of example as to why these moral precepts are limited, is the fact that if uh, kind of there's a very tense situation, if the class struggle actually begins to heat up, these moral precepts again uh, kind of begin to uh, begin to be questioned, and that's what you know I was saying earlier that 
this is, I think, what we're seeing uh, today. <clears throat> there has been this uh, huge, kind of radical rupture in uh, 2008, which, you know, has caused, eventually, consciousness has kind of caught up uh, with, with some delay, it's caused a uh, kind of widespread questioning of, uh, of everything that exists among many, uh, many people. And uh, it did remind me of uh, a section from Their Morals and Ours with, uh, you know, there are some uh, caveats, because here Trotsky is talking about the period leading up to World War I, and so there are uh, some differences. <coughs> But in this, in, in, uh, in this pamphlet, he says that in this period, in the build-up to uh, World War I, there was a huge upswing um, of the capitalist system. And this enabled the ruling class to give certain concessions to the upper layers um, of the working class. And this meant, and this is a quote, he said that democracy appears, appeared solid and the relations between the classes softened, at least outwardly. Thus... Certain elementary moral precepts and social relations were established, along with the norms of democracy and the habits of class collaboration. The impression was created of an ever more free, more just and more humane society. The rising line of progress seemed infinite to common sense. And I'd say we saw a similar process in the run-up to 2008. Now, obviously, there wasn't a huge upsurge of the capitalist system. But I think, generally, there was... Uh, among the majority of people, at least, a sense that at least tomorrow uh, will be better than today. Uh, you know, people weren't obviously living in, uh, in luxury, but uh, they weren't being uh, crushed to the extent that many people uh, feel today. <coughs> but, um, yeah, as I said, we are beginning to see uh, that those ideas, uh, those ideas shaken. And this uh, Trotsky again deals with in, in his pamphlet, where he says, um, he describes this kind of breaking down of the old uh, morality. He says, the elementary moral precepts seemed even more fragile than the democratic institutions and reformist delusions. Mendacity, mendacity, mendacity slander, bribery, venality, coercion, murder grew to unprecedented dimensions, to a stunned simpleton, all these vexations seemed a temporary result of war. Actually, they are manifestations of imperialist decline. The decay of capitalism denotes the decay of contemporary society with its laws and its morals. And as I said, I think we are beginning to see the beginnings of that uh, very same process. Uh, you can just look in countries such as uh, uh, Poland, in Turkey, and Hungary. In, in these countries, you're seeing uh, the retreat of uh, liberal democracy in some uh, senses. In uh, country after country, you're seeing uh, you know, so-called left-wing uh, governments come to power, promising to uh, end auster austerity, and uh, because they accept the limits of capitalism, they go back on their program uh, and end up uh, carrying out even worse austerity than before. Um, in some countries, you don't even need the election of uh, left-wing government. The, con the government is just replaced uh, replaced by a technocratic government to carry out uh, the dictates of uh, the ruling class all the better. One uh, example in the recent period is uh, Italy. <coughs> so, so uh, yes, what this, I think, shows is that the faith, uh, the belief in, the, in democratic morality amongst the ruling class is beginning uh, to be shaken. And uh, this will and is having an impact on, working on the working class as a whole. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, people saw this poll uh, that was carried out. I think it was done by the European Union, but I can't uh, remember. Maybe someone can correct me. But they asked people, um, would you join a large-scale uprising against the government? You know, it's not, they weren't exactly beating around the bush here. And uh, the, the answers, so, in, uh, so this is for between 18 and 34-year-olds. So these are the people who have suffered most, basically, from the response to uh, the crisis from austerity. The response of people in Greece was 67% of people said yes, which, I mean, I guess isn't so surprising given uh, the impact of austerity in Greece. But even in Germany, even in Germany, I think it was 37% of people said yes. So I think you are seeing there's a widespread questioning of the old uh, dem bourgeois democratic uh, norms. 
<clears throat> but I think the point uh, that is not understood uh, by liberals or you know Guardian uh, journalists and those sort of uh, people um, is uh, was understood by Trotsky, and he said um, that morality is a function of the class struggle. Um, and democratic morality corresponds to the epoch of liberal and progressive capitalism. And he also said of that time, um, and again, I think this is applicable in some ways, but obviously with some caveats, he said that the sharpening of the class struggle in passing through its latest phase definitively and irrevocably destroyed this morality, that in its place came the morality of fascism on one side, and on the other, the morality of the proletarian revolution. So as I said, I think a similar process is taking place. We are seeing a polarisation to the left and to the right, where people, under the impact of the crisis and seeing actually the uh, kind of uh, quite brutal and anti-democratic behaviour of the uh, you know, ruling class, are concluding, you know, in certain, uh, to a different extent, that uh, this old bourgeois democratic uh, morality is wrong, and they disagree with it. Now, the one big caveat is that I think, and there are, there was, uh, uh, Rob Sewell gave uh, uh, a talk on this uh, somewhat yesterday, and there is a talk on this uh, during this weekend, um, but I should deal with it just because uh, <laughs> uh, it is an important issue, is that we are not, I would say, uh, likely to see the uh, coming to power of fascism in the near uh, future, which is the big difference from what uh, Trotsky was saying. Uh, fascism, in order to come to power, depends on a mass movement uh, of the middle classes and peasantry, uh, which uh, I mean, Marx called the petty bourgeoisie. Now, if you look at uh, the peasantry, which has been, uh, I mean, basically doesn't really exist in Europe, at least anyway, you uh, also see many uh, kind of independent shopkeepers as well, uh, many of them have been put out of business by uh, the concentration of production uh, of capitalism. <clears throat> and many uh, middle-class professionals, actually, um, if you think about you know, doctors, teachers, nurses, university professors, many of these groups have actually been at the forefront of, uh, of struggles in the recent period. We're moving very much to the left. Also, one of the key reasons is that there has been no major defeat of the working class in the recent period. And in every case that fascism uh, has come to power, it has been uh, off the back of a defeat of the working class. Even so, what I do think we are seeing is that side by side, there is a beginning of the rejection of the old morality by both uh, working class people and uh, the ruling class as a whole. <clears throat> now, one of the... Uh, you know, I'm sure that most people, you know, if you're in this, uh, in this room, will have heard of this... Uh, that most viciously uh, attacked by uh, moralists, the people who are called immoral most often, uh, are Marxists. Uh, more often than not, the, uh, the attack comes uh, in various forms, but usually on the question of uh, means and ends. Usually, uh, Marxists, we're told, because we believe in this utopian, impossible uh, bright future of socialism or communism, because we believe in this, we'll do absolutely anything to achieve it. We'll resort to murder, we'll resort to gulags, we'll resort to all of these terrible things. Uh, and so, in the naive pursuit of the end of revolution, we'll end up causing horrendous crimes. Look at the hundred million people who died uh, in Russia or, and uh, China and the rest of it, they'll say. <clears throat> Now, before uh, answering this, I think it is important sometimes to take a step back and think, OK, fine, what, uh, what system are you defending then? Uh, now, including in this, included in this 100 million uh, dead that is often uh, quoted, supposedly killed by communism, they include people killed by famine. Well, if we look at capitalism in 2018, every year we have over 3 million children starved to death uh, at the same time, we have uh, 1.3 billion kilos of food wasted. Uh, why, is, why does that happen? It's because it's not profitable to feed these kids. Uh, I don't know as well if people have seen uh, this story of where uh, so supermarkets or shops are legally required to dispose of food if it's past its sell-by date. Now, often this food is perfectly fine to eat, but they have to dispose of it. 
They put it in the bins, and many people are desperate in Britain, and so have been scavenging through these bins in order to find food. And what have the supermarkets done? They prosecuted these individuals for theft. This is the kind of mad world we live in. Uh, equally, um, Shelter, which is a homeless charity uh, in Britain, they estimate, and it can only be an estimation because these, uh, these figures are quite hard uh, to measure accurately, but they, they estimate that a quarter of a million people are homeless in the UK. At the same time as that, we have 216,000 homes are left empty, have been left empty in the UK for more than six years. Why are these people housed? Because it's not profitable to house them. So this is the, this is the system they defend. Uh, they uh, allow people to starve, they allow people to be homeless uh, because uh, of the uh, need to make a profit. <clears throat> now they might answer, they might say, well look, you know, at least people are free. Free to starve and be homeless perhaps, but at least people are free. Well, okay, let's look at how uh, working class people are actually treated uh, and in, in, uh, in, in the capitalist system. If you think uh, <clears throat> in, in, uh, in the developed West, in, uh, in the developed West we have, uh, we have uh, you know, sorry, who's, so this eight people who own half the world. Number eight in this list is uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, he's the founder um, of Amazon. And he, ha- he has uh, various warehouses in the developed West, which I was trying to say earlier. Um, and uh, he employs working class people in, uh, in, this, in these factories. And he's, uh, he's come up with various um, great inventions. This is the so-called innovation of capitalism that we're seeing. He's come up with so many great inventions um, in order to aid uh, the working process. One of them is, uh, so they've patented Amazon wheeled cages uh, that they put their workers in. Not entirely sure how that helps uh, with, uh, with work. Um, I mean, it could have something to do uh, with safety, perhaps. Uh, you know, the workers in Amazon warehouses are under such stringent targets uh, to from move, for moving uh, products from one area uh, of the warehouse to another that, uh, that there are a lot of injuries caused. Um, there are also, I mean, so workers are in such a desperate uh, situation that um, often they're forced to urinate in bottles, to defecate in bags, uh, and this kind of huge pressure, as I said, causes injuries. So in last, the last year alone, uh, ambulances were called to Amazon warehouses over 600 times. Um, it's not just in the warehouses that other people uh, suffer. Um, in uh, the Amazon offices, employees are able to anonymously rate other employees. And the results from these uh, ratings are taken into account when uh, they decide who to sack um, <clears throat> it's like something out of Black Mirror, really. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Amazon is not alone uh, in this case. There are plenty uh, more examples. I mean, I'm sure people have seen uh, the example of Sports Direct in the UK, where uh, women are so terrified of taking time off that ambulances have been called uh, because many people have given birth in toilets because they're so uh, scared of taking time off. So that is, you know, that's the system that these people who criticise us uh, for defending, that's the system they defend. Anyway, to actually deal with this question of means and ends. <clears throat> now, when we are deciding whether an action, whether a particular action is moral or not, we do have to have some sort of basis for deciding this, right? Um, and if this basis isn't our own personal <coughs> or social ends, where... Where do we, uh, on what basis do we judge whether something is, uh, is moral or not? If this criteria doesn't come from the material, real world, where does it come from? It has to come from outside reality. Uh, it has to, we have to conclude, basically, that uh, morals, you know, the idea of what is right and what is wrong, that existed before humanity existed, before the solar system existed, before reality itself existed, you're left with the conclusion that uh, there has to be a God, essentially. Um, now, you know, I've already dealt with uh, this question of uh, how you know, there is no such thing, really, as eternal morals. Morals change uh, with the development of uh, society. In many cases, um, it's not just Marxists who, uh, 
who uh, agree with the idea that the end can justify the means. Um, Trotsky gives the example of utilitarianism. So utilitarianism, obviously not a Marxist uh, philosophy, but it's, it's kind of says that we should aim for a society that ensures the greatest possible happiness of the greatest possible number. And Trotsky points out, well, what is this apart from agreeing with the maxim the ends can justify the means? It would say that the ends, the greatest, you can, uh, any means are justified so long as they ensure the greatest possible happiness uh, for the greatest possible number. Um, <coughs> there are also uh, more kind of recent uh, examples. Um, John Rawls, for example, um, if uh, anyone is unlucky enough to study politics at university, which I was cursed with, you'll have had to study this man, who's kind of a bit of a darling of the liberal uh, philosophers at the moment. Anyway, he said that, uh, so he um, ignores all of the history of philosophy. Uh, all of these different individuals who have said, I've come up with the perfect society. Well, luckily, John rules like the Messiah coming down from above. <laughs> He has actually come up with the perfect society. Um, and the perfect society, according to John Rawls, would be run according to two principles. The first of these principles overrides literally everything else, uh, which is that each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive total system of equal basic liberties, compatible with a similar system of liberty for all. And what is that, apart from agreeing with the maxim that uh, any means are justified... <coughs> Uh, provided um, they uh, ensure the end of equal basic liberties for all. Um, and he does justify various things. He justifies huge uh, levels of inequality uh, on the basis, actually, of, uh, you know, we all have the equal right to basic liberty, but some of us might just utilise it uh, slightly differently. Um, <clears throat> but in practical life, too, um, the end always justifies the means. You know, war is always terrible, always terrible, until it's declared. And then this, uh, these, uh, this end of, I don't know, queen and country or you know, eternal peace or whatever other kind of thing they pull out of their arse, basically, all of these things are used to justify the most barbaric means um, of, of war. Or another example, for any Blairite politicians, any and all means, cutting benefits, bombing Iraq, literally anything you ask them to do, all of them are, benefit, uh, all of them are, are justified, provided it achieves the ends of uh, you know, their careers, basically. Um, <coughs> also, what Trotsky points out is that what we, we can't really have some sort of abstract division between, on the one hand, means, and uh, on the other hand, ends. Um, both in practical life and uh, in social movements, the means and the ends uh, constantly swap places. So he gives the example of uh, a machine. If you're building a machine, then that machine is the end. But once the machine is built, then the machine itself becomes a means uh, to further ends, whether, I don't know, creating further commodities or improving productivity or whatever else. <coughs> but also... Bourgeois democratic demands can be the end of a, of a particular social movement. But once these, this <coughs> end is achieved, uh, once, I don't know, you know, they've got a parliament or whatever <coughs> other um, bourgeois democratic demands they've achieved, <coughs> these ends then become means for further ends, i.e. You know, social demands or things like that. So it's not useful to judge means and ends separately. Uh, you have to judge them as a whole, uh, essentially. And anyway, one kind of really good point that Trotsky makes is that even if you say the end justifies the means, well, that says absolutely nothing about what justifies the end. I mean, as I've said, both uh, anti-capitalists and pro-capitalists can agree with this maxim, so it really tells you nothing. Um, so what, you know, for Marxists, does justify the end? <coughs> Well, Trotsky says that uh, something is justified if it leads to the increasing power of humanity over nature and to the abolition of the power of one person over another. Now, does that mean that anything is permissible in order to achieve those, uh, those ends? And quite clearly not, I would say. So this end uh, can only be achieved through 
a uh, socialist revolution where the working class takes power uh, and runs uh, society themselves. <clears throat> because what power over nature do we really have uh, under capitalism? Uh, I'm sure many of you saw the quite apocalyptic, to be honest, uh, stories about the state of the environment over the recent period. And, you know, there was all of this stuff about uh, let's all just be moral and turn the lights off after we've left the room and things like that. When actually, well, <laughs> you know, it came out a little bit later, or at least I saw it a little bit later, who are the real, uh, the real kind of, what is the real reason for the state of the environment being what it is? And that 71% of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions are the result of 100 companies. So how do we sort out the environment? It's by uh, taking... Uh, these 100 companies, putting them under the democratic control of workers and uh, running them, not in the interest of profit, but in the interest of human need. <clears throat> Again, also, how do we uh, get rid of the power of one uh, human being over another when we live in a world where people like Jeff Bezos uh, and others can, uh, can essentially bribe countries in order to uh, make them uh, get rid of all of the labour laws possible by uh, with holding investment or, um, or whatever else. Um, yes, and also, <clears throat> so, you know, I'd say we do need a socialist revolution in order to achieve this, but who is the class, or what is the class that we face uh, in order to carry this out? It's a class that has all of the wealth and all of the power. And so how uh, are we going to achieve this? Well... In order to be successful, that would mean that we would need the support of the majority, uh, the vast majority of the working class. And so that means that this end of the socialist revolution, it precludes by necessity, it, or, you know, basically all of our actions uh, must be kind of uh, directed towards uh, increasing the consciousness consciousness of the working class in its own power and strength and uniting the working class as one, uh, as one fighting force. And that precludes certain means by very definition. We can't uh, carry out any actions uh, that set one part of the working class uh, against another, that attempts to make people happy without their active participation uh, in achieving it, that lowers uh, you know, working people's faith in their own uh, power uh, an organisation. <clears throat> now you could come up with, you could apply this uh, to many different examples, but one uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, thing that Trotsky applies it to is the question of individual terror. Uh, now he says our attitude to an individual assassin would probably be neutral if we knew nothing uh, about them. So you know, on the one hand, we might uh, we might uh, have some sympathy, for example, with an assassin who, in the brutal uh, regime uh, under the Tsar in Russia, who, out of their frustration, uh, assassinated a uh, government official. On the other hand, we uh, would probably abhor the actions of an individual uh, fascist who uh, murdered a socialist politician. But it doesn't stop there for a Marxist. We don't judge whether an action is moral or not purely on the subjective intentions of the person carrying out uh, that action. What for us matters in determining what is moral or what is not is, is that action effective or not? Does that act bring us closer to the goal of a socialist revolution or not? And so Trotsky concludes about individual terrorism, he says, well, actually, no. It doesn't bring us closer to a socialist revolution because what it does is it replaces uh, the actions of the working class with the actions of one individual person. And so it lowers the faith of uh, working people in their own power, uh, basically. But he then goes on to say that this can all change in a different context. So, for example, in the context of a civil war, in the context of the Spanish Civil War, uh, the murder of uh, General Franco and one of his other uh, generals, the context, the character of that action would change because rather than being individual terror, it would be part of a collective struggle against fascism. <clears throat> so what this shows, I think, is that for Marxists, moral evaluations uh, are very much tied to the question of revolutionary strategy and tactics. Uh, they flow from the inner needs of the struggle. 
So unfortunately, like many questions, there are no easy answers uh, to this question. We can't know in advance uh, what is and what isn't permissible from uh, the point of view of, uh, of Marxist morality. Ultimately, it would be the living experience of the movement with the guidance of theory uh, that tells us what is and what isn't permissible. Uh, and this question of theory is of paramount importance, to be honest. Uh, Marx was the, uh, said that the ruling ideas of any society are the ideas of the ruling class. Uh, and so we need, this, you know, we need to study Marxist theory, uh, which ultimately is the crystallised experience of the working class in struggle. We need to learn from the experiences of the past in order, uh, and, and then apply these lessons uh, to the moving uh, and changing environment uh, that we find ourselves in. <clears throat> um, so, what is moral uh, to be a Marxist then? Finally got there. Um, because we do have a mor morality. Marxists do have a morality. Uh, and what I would say is that what is moral is to participate in a movement that can finally, uh, can finally put an end to the want, poverty and suffering uh, that blights our world today. Uh, our job, sitting in this room today, is not to carry out the revolution ourselves. Uh, the, work, the liberation of the working class is the job of the working class at the end of the day. But what history has shown is that whenever the working class have moved into action in order to change society, what has, what has been the lacking thing? The lacking thing has never been the will of working class people to change society. That's never been questioned. What has been lacking time and time again uh, is, a, is, a, is a leadership that can bring these crystallised experiences, these lessons from the past, and use them to guide, uh, guide the movement as a whole. So, you know, I often get asked, what can we do now to change society? And what we can do now to change society is to build an organisation now so that once the working class do move into action, they have a leadership that is worthy uh, of them. Thanks.